Hello, my name is Clive Warren and it's a pleasure to have this opportunity to give you this presentation at the virtual 3DMC Metrology Conference. What I'd like to talk about is five reasons why the laser, that laser triangulation is still the technology of choice for many of today's measurement applications. So first of all, a few words about the scope of the presentation. Um, it's aimed at quality control and production engineers interested in non-contact measurement solutions for industrial metrology applications. And to be more specific, why a particular type of sensor that has been around for many years may still be the best choice for your needs. So first, a little bit of background. Laser triangulation distance sensors has been widely used in metrology, along with a host of other optical techniques for many years. While the technology is not new, it is particularly well suited to certain applications, providing a desirable balance of cost versus performance. This presentation looks at the fundamental design of laser triangulation sensor, its various embodiments, and how it is particularly well suited to certain types of measurement. We will also look at how these sensors can be tuned to suit the characteristics of the object under test. So the content of today's presentation, we're going to talk a little bit about laser basics, gives you an understanding of how actually how lasers work. We're then going to talk about how that um, technology applies to laser distance measurement, and I'm going to give you a few examples of that. We'll then look at um, laser triangulation sensors in, uh, in more detail and the limitations and challenges associated with that kind of sensor. And finally, I'll give you five reasons why you may want to use a laser triangulation sensor in your measurement work. So let's start off by looking at the word laser, an acronym for light amplification by stimulated emission of radiation. Okay, let's start by looking at stimulated emission. This is the process whereby an incoming photon of a specific frequency interacts with an excited atomic electron, causing it to drop to a lower energy level. Liberated energy transfers to the electromagnetic field, creating a new photon with a phase, frequency, polarization and direction of travel that are all identical to the photons of the incident wave. The stimulated emission takes place in the optical cavity. This is essentially a pair of mirrors. Uh, we have a total reflector at one side, a partial reflector at the other. When the cavity is energized by the input of pumping energy, this could be from another light source, that's another laser or a flashlight, or it could be electrical energy. So with the um, cavity energized, um, the light within the cavity is reflected off the mirror on the left and off the mirror on the right. But because the mirror on the right is a partial reflector, some of the light passes through, creating the output beam. The gain medium itself, this could be a variety of different materials. Um, it could be crystal, it could be a, a, a form of glass, it could be a gas, a semiconductor material, or even a liquid. OK, so what's special about the light that's emitted from a laser? Well, first of all, it is monochromatic and coherent. So let's have a look at what that means. White light, for example, which is the sort of light you might get from an incandescent light bulb or even the sun, is defined as the complete mixture of all the wavelength of the, vis of the visible spectrum. In contrast, monochromatic light is where you only have a single wavelength or color being emitted. And finally, in physics, um, two wave sources are perfectly coherent if their frequency and waveform are identical and their phase difference is constant. So let's look at wavelength. Um, typically referred to as lambda, it's determined by the gain medium of the laser cavity. And as you can see from the chart on the right, there's a, a variety of different um, gain mediums used for different types of laser. For example, helium neon. Uh, this is, uh, helium neon lasers are typically used for interferometry. Um, a ruby laser, perhaps, uh, uh, that was actually the basis of the very first laser developed back in 1960, um, but today you might find a ruby laser deployed for uh, things such as holography or even um, tattoo removal. 
And we also have um, semiconductor materials used as gain mediums. These are commonly used in laser diodes. And so the wavelength determines where we are on the electromagnetic spectrum. Key thing to understand about the electromagnetic spectrum is that between the range of around 400 nanometers and 700 nanometer wavelength, we have visible light ranging from the violet to the, uh, to the red. Outside of this range, you have uh, non-visible light um, ranging from ultraviolet at one end and infrared at the other. And finally, we have frequency, the frequency of a laser. Um, this is simply a calculation based on the um, speed of light um, divided by the wavelength, and this gives you the frequency. I'd now like to talk about laser distance measurement and three common ways of measuring distance with a laser. The first example of laser distance measurement that I'd like to give is interferometry. In this case, uh, the example shows a Michelson interferometer um, where we have a laser source, a polarizing beam splitter and a moving retroreflector. The moving retroreflector would typically be attached to the um, object, um, the, the distance of which we're trying to measure. And the way this works is a beam is emitted from the laser. It hits the beam splitter and at this point it is split. Part of the beam reflects, reflects up to this um, fixed retroreflector up here, back to the beam splitter and again is reflected back into the laser head. That's called the, um, the reference arm. Um, the other part of the beam passes through the beam splitter carries on to the moving retroreflector where it's returned to the beam splitter and then onto the laser head. At the point where it passes through the beam splitter, it interferes with the reference arm, causing the generation of interference fringes, which are counted by detectors inside the laser head. Now, of course, those interference fringes are spaced relative to the wavelength of the laser. So if the wavelength of the laser is known, we're able to derive distance. So distance of, um, uh, of this measurement of this type is determined by the wavelength of the laser. It can provide very high levels of accuracy. So typically better than um, 0.5 parts per million can be achieved if you're using environmental compensation. Um, that's equivalent to um, half a micron in a, in a meter, for example. And um, by calibrating the frequency of the laser, um, we can provide direct uh, traceability back to the SI definition of the, the meter. Um, of course, an interferometer setup like this requires um, a careful, um, careful setup and it uses relatively expensive optics. Here is a typical example of an interferometer system. You have your laser source, your beam splitter and the moving retroreflector. The second example of laser distance measurement is the um, time of flight laser. In this case, um, uh, distance is derived from the time it takes for a, um, for a light wave to travel from the laser source to the object to which you're measuring distance to and back to the, back to the laser source. So the distance is cal calculated simply by multiplying the speed of light with the elapsed time, dividing it by two, and that gives you a distance. This kind of system is um, well suited to long range measurements, typically in the meters to kilometer range. And um, it may not require a um, collaborative target. In other words, you can um, target the beam at the, directly at the object to, to, that you wish to measure distance to. 
couple of examples here of um, time of flight lasers. There's a little handheld uh, like a disto, a disto here on the left. This is the sort of thing you may use to measure uh, the, 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 the size of a room, for example. A uh, much more ex sophisticated example is the surface a 3D scanner, because both of these are using time of flight lasers. And finally, we have laser triangulation. A laser triangulation sensor comprises of a diode type laser, a lens and an image sensor. The laser produces a spot on the surface under test. This spot is focused onto the image sensor and the position of the spot on the image sensor enables calculation of an angle from which distance can be derived. So as you can see, as the position of the surface under test moves, it results in the beam impinging on the image sensor in a different location. It's important to note that the relative position of the laser, the image sensor and the lens must be known for this to be, for, for this to be achieved. There are typically two types of uh, laser triangulation sensor. Uh, the first is a point sensor where the beam is projected as a spot onto the surface under test. Uh, the sensor then outputs the distance to the surface. Um, in these configurations, the sensor is typically mounted in a, uh, in a fixed location. But to obtain absolute uh, uh, distance measurements, you would need to perform a careful calibration of the whole setup before the measurement data can be used. The second way that a um, laser triangulation could be configured would be as a uh, line sensor. This is where the uh, laser uh, projects a continuous line of light across the uh, surface under test. And this provides you with a uh, 2D profile of the target. Um, it's also possible to obtain 3D point clouds um, by moving the target um, perpendicular to the, uh, to the laser line. So let's have a look at this principle in more detail. So we have the um, laser uh, projecting a line onto the object under test, being detected by a camera or, uh, or, or, or lens, and the resulting line appears on an image sensor. Um, but what we need to note is that the projected line appears distorted uh, once it reaches the image sensor and analysis of that distorted image enables reconstruction of the object's shape, providing you with a 2D profile. Um, it's also possible to obtain a 3D point cloud from this type of sensor by moving the object um, across the, um, the, the laser line. Again, um, a calibration of this kind of setup is essential to ensure accurate results are obtained. So let's look at some of the challenges um, faced by designers and users of laser triangulation sensors. Um, first of all, there are the environmental challenges. The key one of these being ambient light. So this could be the effects of um, overhead lighting in the factory. It could be sunlight. It um, could be uh, shadowing, something like that, all of which can affect the light that's impinging on the image sensor. Um, over the years, this, this problem has largely been solved by deploying filters that um, only allow uh, the specific wavelength of the laser to pass through, effectively blocking out all other, um, all other light forms and enabling uh, accurate um, or reliable measurements to be taken. The next challenge uh, with these sensors is temperature. I mentioned earlier that the, uh, the laser, the lens and the image sensor all need to be in a fixed relationship to each other. Um, so the effects of temperature causing any change in that position can have a dramatic effect on the uh, me measurements. So very careful design is required and use of uh, materials with a low coefficient of expansion to ensure uh, the effects of temperature are, are minimized. 
So the next challenge is spectral transmission. This is the transmission of light through a material. So if you want to measure a clear material, let's say the um, uh, some automotive glass or the, um, or the protective cover on a headlight, um, you're going to have to choose a laser with an appropriate wavelength. Let's take a look at this chart. This is a um, plot of the um, transmission of light through a polycarbonate material um, relative to wavelength. As you'll see in the um, ultraviolet wavelength down here, below um, 400 nanometers, um, the material is effectively opaque uh, to the light, so you get plenty of signal back in that range. However, above um, 400 nanometers, all of a sudden the, um, the, the spectral transmission changes and the majority of the light is now passing through the material, meaning you're unlikely to get a spot on the surface that you could um, image with the uh, image sensor. So obviously, depending on the sort of material you're going to use, uh, will determine um, what, what, what would be an appropriate wavelength to use for, um, for, for measurement. Let's now look at an example of a smart laser triangulation sensor. Uh, this is an all-in-one de self-contained device based on laser triangulation technology. And because of the compact nature of the sensor, it's possible to include the central processing unit, application software, the um, human device interface or the GUI, uh, data storage and communications hardware, all in a compact and robust unit that can be deployed by hand or in automated applications. These sensors can be used on a variety of different um, measurement applications, um, measuring features such as gaps, flushes, chamfers, edges, radii, um, angles, seals, steps, um, mismatches. So very commonly used in the automotive world, um, aerospace and uh, white goods industries, for example. And now we come to five reasons why you might want to use a laser triangulation sensor. Number one, they're a mature technology that has been tested and refined over the years. Number two, they are robust and reliable. Number three, the design enables them to be made very compact. Number four, this compactness makes them ideally suited to both automated and handheld applications in manufacturing. And number five, they are equally well suited to inline and offline applications. So there you have it, five reasons why you may want to use a laser triangulation sensor. Um, once again, thank you for um, viewing the presentation. And if you require any further information, please don't hesitate to get in touch. Thank you.